Warning! There's a lot of violence in this video, as well as some spoiler warnings. Warning! Also, I'm going to be running my fan through the whole video, so if you see a little buzzing sound, if you hear it, I don't know how you'd see it, but if you hear it, I apologize. Warning! Ah, no more heroes. I love this series. The Misadventures of the Assassin Fighter Travis Touchdown is an awesome series that eventually I'll revisit. Until then, I finally was able to play and beat No More Heroes 3. It was on and off for the last several months, but I finally managed to defeat all the aliens. Yeah, aliens. No More Heroes 1 and 2 are insane, but you know, let's raise the bar with aliens because, yeah, where else can you go? But realistically, I was super happy when No More Heroes 3 was teased heavily in the ending of No More Heroes Travis Strikes Back. Yeah, the spin-off. Actually, let me address that. I don't think you really need to play the first or second game to really understand this game. However, the spin-off is a bit of a different story. Don't get me wrong, there isn't too much to the story. Like, you could still probably enjoy this game without diving into the spin-off game. Unless you really care about the plot. Or, uh, you know, played the first two games. Yeah, if you played the first two games, particularly No More Heroes 1, there's something that happens in the spin-off. You may be confused by what you see essentially in the beginning of the game. You won't know who Batman is? Yeah. He shows up very briefly in the beginning of the game, and you're not going to know who Batman is if you haven't played the spin-off. Anyway, it's time for me to talk about No More Heroes 3 before I eventually redo my reviews of the rest of the series, since I review slightly differently now. So let's do it. The main villain is an alien with an overly complicated name, but for dum-dums like me, he has an easier name. So let's do this. Let's take on Prince Fu! Prince Fu, I wonder if that's a parody off of Kung Fu. Knowing this series, I wouldn't be surprised. And okay, I lied a bit in the intro, giving people a chance to kind of avoid spoilers from this game, but the spin-off as well. Let me explain some of the characters, though, and help you catch up. Travis is an otaku assassin obsessed with anime, a director named Mikkei, and video games. He has a discount lightsaber, and yes, the series rips off Star Wars a lot. Travis kills in fighting assassin tournaments, and ended up marrying the female narrator, Sylvia. Sylvia is the announcer for the Death Games, former wife of Travis's brother Henry Cooldown, and is now married to Travis with some of his kids. The girl on the left here is Shinobu. She was an opponent from the first game, follows Travis around calling him master after he spared her life, and is barely in the game. See, she has a thing about losing her arms very similar to Jedi, and may as well be a running gag. Heavily injured by Fu. The girl on the right is Bad Girl, a female fighter also from the first game who was killed by Travis. This is the real confusing part. In the spin-off, she was revived from the dead by a dragon that appeared after gathering up seven balls. No shit, this series blatantly parodies everything, including anime. Anyway, this was done by Travis and Badman, Bad Girl's father, who was killed effortlessly by Prince Fu here. The last game had them talking about going their separate ways, and here they are all moved into Travis's hotel. Guess they didn't get very far. The motel, also known as No More Heroes Motel, is owned by Dr. Naomi, a scientist who is a tree for no real reason in this game. She was human and well endowed for one at that, but now she's a tree. Huh. Her sister from the spinoff is here too, in virtual form. Last but not least, we have Jean, the female cat. As of the spinoff, she started talking, and she's voiced by a very, very deep-voiced male. Ha ha ha! Oh, no more heroes. Anyway, Travis wants to save the world and avenge Badman since Prince Fu killed him. Prince Fu is old friends with this human by the name of Damon. Damon and Prince Fu had a similar story to E.T., but Prince Fu is back and wanting to conquer the world for Damon's sake, even though Damon claims he doesn't want that. As you move through the story, you eventually learn that Damon is kind of an asshole and that Fu is really here to kill somebody for Damon. Turns out it's Travis. Yeah, Travis hit Damon in the spin-off game and... Thanks to that, I guess, um, yeah, Damon really wants revenge. Travis did it to get one of the balls, but, you know, Damon kind of took it personal. I guess he's never been hit. Damon even gets tired of waiting around for Fu and his gang to kill Travis and hires Henry to do the job for him. Henry has been into some weird stuff lately, again, shown very well in the spin-off game, and even after Travis kills him too, Henry somehow comes back and kills Travis. 
Somehow, though, Travis pops up back alive in his own grave, and thanks to Mike, the real-life director, is saved from his own grave. Uh, Travis eventually manages to kill Prince Fu, and then after Damon gains all sorts of weird powers, Travis manages to kill him as well. Afterwards, we find out that Jean, uh, not the cat, but Travis's daughter, managed to revive Travis from death, hence the entire grave scene. Jean and her brother are time-traveling because Henry messed up the entire future, something hinted at with a fight earlier in the game. The third alien is actually killed by a futuristic ninja, and after this guy just kind of gives you some special moves, he fights Travis, calling him Grandpa. Come to find out, this kid is indeed Travis's grandkid, time-traveling son of Jean. And yes, Travis named his cat and his daughter with the same name. So that's the basic overview of the plot. It isn't too complicated if you can get over the aliens and time traveling, but it isn't where the writing shines either. Travis and Fu both have cutscenes where they hang out with their friends. You really learn some of the characterization with the characters this way. You learn all about Fu's alien buddies and Fu himself. You learn more about Damon, and you learn about Travis's friends as well. Travis and his friend Bishop constantly talk about Mika and his films through the game. Oh! Bishop! Ah, uh, I forgot about him. He runs this video store that Travis likes to go to. And no, he wasn't wished back. This is the not the original Bishop. He died in the second game. Yeah, it's his younger brother. Uh, Bishop is a last name. Anyway, sometimes Bad Girl, Shinobu, and other characters pop in from time to time with these. And I think that's a great way to build up some of these characters. Since they're barely in the game to begin with anyway. Overall, the writing and humor are on perfect point and form. From the fourth wall breaks to Gene the Cat's snarky as hell attitude, I actually really like the writing here. And I love, love, love the presentation here as well. The visual effects of lighting and design are awesome, and the subtle parodies of different game genres is fantastic. No More Heroes used to do over the top violent references and parodies to movies and other media, and now it's doing this for video games. That's awesome. The design and the outfits of the returning characters are all the same from the spin-off game I love bringing up, and the only different one is actually Travis. Travis and his mech suit are all unique for this game, but I enjoy the way he looks this game regardless. And the return to red is great, although his look is actually customizable. The aliens I wasn't vibing off at first though, they're really weird and off-putting, but after a bit it kind of dawned on me that their designs were alien to me. Weird, right? The designs are so out there that they are alien, which is actually kind of funny, all things considered. Still, there was a lot of thought in these designs. Some of the aliens are pretty standard, some look like they're old polygon-like creatures, and some are just kind of weird looking. Yeah, they're all inspired by old alien movies, I think. Fu's elites are all weird designs too, but it's great that they don't look all the same species. Fu has collected minions from a multitude of galaxies, after all. However, some of my favorite design aliens you don't actually get to fight, sadly. Look at this guy, dancing with this pop idol. He looks so cool! Oh, he was killed by the idol, who happens to be a returning Kimmy Howell from No More Heroes 2. Looks like she isn't an optional boss fight this time. Still, she looks fine as an assassin. <laughs> uh, she also rap battles. That's a nice touch. I also like how fighting Travis's grandkid looks. He runs up walls and stuff like an actual ninja, and this is during gameplay. Fu's design is pretty cool too once you get used to the color blue. Henry's design here looks more like Travis, I mean they are twins, but Henry's definitely more monstrous here. We even get some new backstory for Henry, Travis, and their half-sister Jean, who Travis keeps naming things after. That's kinda cool. Last but not least, we have the music. Oh. I often love a select few tracks from every No More Heroes game, and this is no exception. Don't get me wrong, the OST is fantastic, but nothing in the game beats out the sushi theme for me. You can sit down and buy sushi in this game. This theme hits so hard for a track that you may only hear a few seconds of it at a time. I had to go listen to the full track, and yeah, this rap is fantastic. The battle themes for regular enemies are great. The Thunderdome Overworld bike theme is excellent. Velvet Chair Girl's theme is also very, really good. So good, guys. There's even a Final Fantasy-inspired remix of the main theme of the entire series. 
The music in the overworlds change depending on if you're on foot or on bike even. Is that a reference to Yoshi? That might be a reference to Yoshi. The OST is massive this time around, but damn it if it isn't great overall. Along with graphics and character designs, this game is charming as hell. So, No More Heroes 3 kind of plays like every other No More Heroes game, but with some added bells and whistles. You have light and heavy swings, jump, and a dodge. The dodge is neutered though. You don't dodge through all damaging attacks and will actually have to jump around things this time. And dodging in the correct direction, yeah, it's kind of a pain to get used to. They also added in a few new moves for Travis. That switch looking device is indeed a gaming device, but once again, from the spin off game, this is kind of deadly in this world. At first, Travis only has a jump kick, which is pretty potent for sure, but nothing special. However, after a visit from his time traveling grandkid, Travis gets some new moves. Able to eventually set a ring of extra damage, a ring to stop time, and a psychic throw which can damage other enemies depending on your aim, Travis gets pretty damn powerful. You have to hold down one of your upper buttons and then use the face buttons, replacing the original moveset. These of course have cooldown periods with, with the time stopping ability naturally having a longer cooldown because without that, that would totally be overpowered. But it's still kind of overpowered anyway. You can equip chips to change damage outputs as well as different stats, usually adding some like power and subtracting something like defense. Last, you can upgrade your stats thanks to Dr. Naomi, who's the big tree. Wait a minute, is she a tree because of a pun? Oh no, she turned herself into a skill tree. Oh. Anyway, last but not least, you can have sushi with you. Yeah, remember me mentioning that awesome sushi track? Well, you can buy sushi. You can buy emergency sushi to take with you that will heal you up or give you a boost in damage. Or before boss fights, you can actually buy an entire meal that boosts stats or that'll auto heal you if you die. Took me forever to learn how to use it though. You select the piece with the D-pad and then press up on the D-pad to use the selected piece of sushi. I probably should have used the time to actually learn this a lot quicker, but oh well. Overall, the gameplay is fantastic. It is basically no more heroes when it comes to gameplay, and that's not a bad thing, but it adds a lot more layers to it as well. Now, level design, that's where things get a little bad. Look, not all of this is bad exactly, but the regular levels from 1 to 2 are basically gone. Instead, you have enemy waves. You know how in combat games there are things you do in levels to break up regular combat so it doesn't get super boring? This game's never clearly heard of that. You have these overworlds. None of them are too bad, although Call of Battle is kind of annoying to traverse, but the rest are perfectly fine. You ride your bike to certain points on the map. You are taken to a specific room to fight a wave of enemies. Then you go back to the overworld. It's like grinding out the side missions from the first game that you did for extra cash, but that's the entire game now outside of the boss fights. Does that sound extra fun? No. Does that sound lame? Good, because it is. The enemies aren't anything to write home about either. Most are actually kind of annoying to deal with. One snipes at a distance and leaves mines, one forms barriers, one's practically a mini-boss in the game that seems to think it should be placed like regular enemies. And there are mini-bosses for sure, but none of them are too bad. This skull dude can glitch the game, I suppose, as he attacks and can be annoying. He's the first mini-boss that you can encounter, too. However, the others... I don't know, this thing is slow and it hits really hard. This guy has a shield, which doesn't actually mean much. Overall, the smaller enemies actually cause more trouble. However, there are some semblance of fun in some of these. Every so often, you battle a huge monster in space. You know, the final frontier. The game becomes a space shooter type level in which you're in a mech and you're finding weak points and shooting the alien to goo. This is actually really fun when it happens. There are only three of these types of boss fights in the game. However, talking about the boss fights has always been the main highlight of No More Heroes as a series. Still don't necessarily think they should uh, remove all the levels. They were still fun, especially No More Heroes 2, but it's time for some positives. When you reach a boss in this game, you don't really know what to expect. The first couple, like Mr. Black Hole and Joe Gold, are fairly standard. Native Dancer, the correct name for Travis's grandkid, is a pretty cool fight with shadow clones and 
anime as hell ninja moves, but again, fairly standard all things considered. It's when you actually fight Kimmy Love, uh, Kimmy Hell's new name, that things change a little bit. She uses stage props to fight as well as a beam katana of her own. Then Velvet Chair Girl just throws you into a mock rhythm game. You play musical chairs with her and end up fighting her octopus pet that shoots big lasers. Midori Midori Waka, or is that Midori Midori Kawa? Yeah, Midori Midori Kawa, my bad, actually has a miniature level before facing her. A little first person horror experience, which is actually really fun. Boss fight of her was great too. During combat, sometimes you can turn into a mech form that Travis uses at the beginning of the game and blow away most anything. In the fight with Midori, you are in that mech, a new form of it even, although the entire battle, which is totally awesome. You then have a rematch with Destroy Man, which is kind of a bit of a level 2 as his clones come and attack you first. Fun fight, but a bit traditional. The next several levels are some of the best in the series though. JRPG fight? Fantastic fights with Fu and Henry, Smash Bros, Damon X Machina, totally awesome. The boss fights are worth the dull waves of enemies beforehand, I promise, but man, those can be rough. They're just busy work, and it does bring the game down a couple of pegs. Now, luckily, these overworlds aren't quite as dull as they used to be in the first game. You can do a lot of stuff in between fights to break up the drag of getting to the bosses. You can find collectibles in the form of scorpions, trading cards, kittens, and you get paid for these. Uh, there are two types of currency in this game, by the way. One is regular money, while the other you use to boost up your experience points. But you have to pay both sometimes for collectibles anyway. Oops. Anyway, you get paid for returning these things. You can find doppelganger all over the place as well for some special clothing. Actually, you can find friendly aliens who give you t-shirts and clothing for completing special tasks, sort of like achievements, but with in-game rewards. You also have plenty of side jobs and extra fights to do as well. Let me say this, mowing the lawn has never been this fun, even in the first game. You can unclog toilets to open up some save points, you can take out gang members in Akira-style bike mini-games, you can shoot a huge gator from a tank. You want to pick up garbage? Yeah, yeah, you may have to suplex an alligator to make bank on this, but you can do it. You can, you know, mine in a cave as well for some extra money. There are tons of side quests you can do like this that are, for the most part, actually really fun to do. You also can find some adventure style side quest. He's had me going to certain locations to collect or destroy certain things, and one even opened up a gotcha machine vendor in the hotel. Pay money of sorts and you get models for the past foes or even replicas of past fights. These are actually really cool. Last but not least, a few times during the game and whenever you visit Travis's house, you can play Deathman. Deathman meets Travis in game as Deathman is real in the afterlife in this universe. Huh, I wonder if he's related to Sheeny Mimi from the second game. Anyway, this game is side-scrolling beat-em-up type game, like something you'd see from the Sega Genesis era. Pretty fun, all things considered. Overall, if you like minigames or just exploring larger overworlds for collectibles, there's something for you here outside of the main game, which is awesome. Look, if I didn't make it clear, I love this game. There's a ton of charm, the gameplay is fun, the side content is also really fun, the boss fights are great, and the character building is awesome. I do think the story is a bit clunky and heavily requires knowledge from the Travis Strikes Back spin-off game. This crap doesn't fly with me, not here or in Kingdom Hearts. Lastly, there is no proper levels. Just mindless wave of enemies in reused rooms, and the enemies are kind of annoying. This alone ruins some scores in other reviews entirely. Other people's reviews, that is, like GameStop or GameSpot or whatever the hell that website's called. Eh. My opinion, though, if you can get through the rough stuff, you'll find this is a fantastic experience outside of those issues. That means these issues are overly disappointing, I get it. But overall, I think the game is great. I'd give it a solid 8 out of 10. If you get a chance, try it out. And while the beginning can be very rough, the ending is more than worth it. If you're already a No More Heroes fan though and you haven't played this game, what the hell are you waiting for? You will enjoy the game if you stick with it, trust me. 
But that's all the time I have to talk about No More Heroes 3. I'm glad I finally got to play the game, and I'm hoping there's going to be a No More Heroes 4 before too long. But for now, I'm going to be working on the last project of Season 5, maybe. Hopefully, I'll get it done soon. Can't wait to talk about Super Mario Odyssey! Yeah! So, you know, like, subscribe, comment, share your opinions. We'll see you in the next video. Take care, my minions! <laughs>